Hi there, welcome back to class. We're going to continue with the chemistry of life, part three. So our objectives are we want to be able to define solute, solvent, solution, salt, ions, and electrolytes. So a solution is a substance consisting of two or more substances mixed together and uniformly dispersed, most commonly the result of dissolving a solid, fluid, or gas in a liquid. So the solute is the material or the solid that is dissolving into the solvent. So let's take a look at our slide here again um, about the fact that water is a universal solvent. So salts dissolve in solution or ionic compounds dissolve in uh, water well in aqueous solution. And remember our bodies are based on aqueous solution because the hydrogen side of the water molecules is positively charged. So that surrounds, that part of the water molecules surrounds the negative ion, which in this case is the chlorine. Whereas the oxygen side of the water molecule is negatively charged. Remember the polarity of the water molecule. So that wraps around the positive ion in sodium chloride, table salt, uh, and helps that to dissolve in solution. So there's parts of the water molecule that can interact with uh, both. The oxygen negative side of the water molecule is interacting with the positive ion, and the hydrogen positive parts of the water molecule are interacting with the chlorine, just weakly forming chemical bonds. So a solute, like in this example of salt water, the solute would be the salt, sodium chloride, whereas the solvent is the liquid water molecules. So some other characteristics of solutions are that like dissolves like. So nonpolar solvents tend to dissolve nonpolar solutes better than polar solvents. So polar solvents tend to dissolve polar solutes better than nonpolar solvents. So many nonpolar solvents are like your waxes, your oils, and of course water is able to dissolve the polar solutes and has polarity itself as a molecule. Another characteristic of solutions is that raising the temperature of a solution is going to increase the solubility of most solid solutes. So like when we're making candy or syrup of some kind and uh, we mix uh, sugar um, into water and we boil that water so that energy added to that chemical reaction causes the sugar, the solute, to melt into the solution easier and quicker to make that syrup. Another characteristic of solutions is that increasing the pressure above a solution is going to increase the solubility of most gaseous solutes. So when we're making food, for instance, uh, with a pressure cooker in our kitchen, of course, and we want to, uh, or in a lab with that pressure cooker, when we want to get a certain gas that is a solute into solution, if we increase the pressure of that gas above that liquid solution, then it's going to force that uh, gaseous solute into the solution better. A good example of this is our um, cardiovascular system, our bloodstream. So we have many solutes that are dissolved in our solution of our blood, our blood plasma. And that's a closed, closed system where that liquid is so that those solutes, some of them, the gaseous solutes like the oxygen and the carbon dioxide, are dissolved in that aqueous solution in our body. So let's talk about electrolytes, salts, and ions. A salt, like the chemical definition of a salt, is that we have an ionic compound that contains cations instead of hydrogen and anions instead of hydroxide. Remember, the hydrogen and the hydroxide are the way that water disassociates in solution. So salts tend to break apart in aqueous solution because of um, the fact that the water molecule can surround 
um, those different ions and cause it to dissolve in solution, like we were looking in, uh, at in that earlier slide. An electrolyte is a chemical compound that's able to conduct electricity, and ions are electrolytes. So when I'm talking about um, ions in the body, I'm talking about your electrolytes or your salts in your body. So some examples of salts that we'll be talking about in this class are like sodium chloride, calcium carbonate, your potassium chloride, and then calcium phosphates, which are found in bone and teeth. I apologize, this three should actually be a smaller uh, font. So that'd be CO3, it should be a smaller font. So ions in cells, in our body, in our blood, or in other organic molecules, or other organic, sorry, materials, um, do a bunch of different jobs in the body for us. Our body is based on aqueous solution, and our ions in those solution help to control fluid levels, like in our urinary system. Um, the kidneys help to filter out hydrogen ions. We also can maintain normal pH levels in our bloodstream because of the ions that exist in our blood. Remember that buffering system that we talked about in uh, Chemistry of Life Part 2. And then ensuring the correct electric potential between nerve cells enables the transmission of nerve signals. So the movement of ions across the cell membrane of the neuron the sodium and potassium moving across that membrane cause that action potential to go down the neuron. And we'll be discussing that in more detail later on when we cover the nervous system. So now we want to talk about the four major categories of macromolecules or biological uh, macromolecules that are used in the body. We want to just review these. These are an important aspect of understanding the anatomy and physiology that we're going to be talking about. So for every uh, category of macromolecule, we're going to give an example for each. We're going to be able to explain their function as it relates to the human body and be able to recognize the name of the subunit called the monomer from which that uh, biological macromolecule is built. Depending on the subunit that these macromolecules are built of, they have different chemical properties. So that affects the way that chemical reactions occur in our body. We want to also be able to define and explain the role of enzymes in the human body. So our four categories of macromolecule are your carbohydrates, your lipids, your proteins, and your nucleic acids. So for each one, we're going to be talking about what they're built of, what their function is in the human body, and some examples for that particular type of macromolecule. Now, all of these macromolecules are composed of one primary element that is a very important element for living things on the planet, and that is carbon. Carbon has this amazing ability to interact with four other uh, types of atoms. It can also interact with itself. It can form double bonds, it can form triple bonds, and it can form uh, rings, these carbon rings, and then chains of those rings. So these macromolecules are so big um, because they are carbon-based. Carbon is a very special element for living things. In fact, by definition, an organic molecule, a macromolecule, is carbon-based. So one thing that is very uh, useful for studying the biological macromolecules is creating a study chart that looks like this. So in your notes, in your lecture notes for this class, I would ask that you create this study chart so that you can review the uh, subunit that makes up each of these macromolecules that we're going to be talking about, the functions for those um, macromolecules in living systems generally, and examples for each one of those macromolecules. So 
just take some time, maybe pause the video and go ahead and write down this chart uh, before you watch the rest of the video so that you can fill in these categories as we go through the uh, different types of macromolecules. So we're going to be talking about the carbohydrates, the lipids, the proteins, and the nucleic acids. Please pause the video at this time and go ahead and write this chart down in your lecture notes. All right, let's proceed and talk about polymers. So polymers are large orga organic macromolecules that are made up of many repeating units or subunits. These repeating units are called monomers, and they're distinguished by different identities uh, of those subunit, the monomer subunits. So different types of monomers have different types of chemical properties that affect chemical reactions in the body. So this is a general diagram of the way that polymers are built and the way that polymers are broken down. Polymers are built through what's called a dehydration synthesis or a condensation reaction. And what happens generally in that reaction is hydrogen from the, the one side and a hydroxide from the other are chopped off by typically enzymes joined together and create water. So that's why it's called a dehydration synthesis. In that chemical bonding site, that monomer can be linked to that growing polymer chain and create the polymer. So a dehydration synthesis is the way that polymers are built. Polymers are broken down through the opposite of that reaction called hydrolysis. So in this reaction, the water molecule is used and it's broken apart and the chemical bond here between the monomer and the other part of the polymer is broken apart using water and we get the hydrogen attached to the one side chemically bonded and the hydroxide to the other. So that splits apart um, that monomer from the rest of the uh, chain of monomers, which is the polymer. So that is how the uh, polymer is broken down. A nice way to remember it is to think of the word hydrolysis. Lysis means to cut hydro with hydrogen. So literally translated hydrolysis, to cut with hydrogen. So our four biological macromolecules that we're going to be discussing are your carbohydrates, your lipids, your proteins, and your nucleic acids. So let's talk about the carbohydrates. The carbohydrates are our sugars. Our sugars can range from a simple sugar, which is made up of one carbon ring, like glucose or fructose, and more and more complex sugars that are made up of many simple sugars linked together in a chain. All of the sugars exist in a ratio of one carbon to two hydrogen to one oxygen. Therefore, they're called hydrates of carbon. The purpose or function of the carbohydrates in living cells is typically short-term energy storage in all organisms. So the monomer building block for the sugars, the carbohydrates, is a simple sugar, like for example, glucose or fructose. Simple sugars are called monosaccharides. Saccharides in Latin meaning sugar, mono meaning one. And here's how we can draw the chemical formula showing these simple sugars. The disaccharides are two monosaccharides linked together in a chain, so di to saccharide sugar. The polysaccharides are many sugars linked together in a chain to make a more complex sugar. So here you can see glycogen, which is the complex animal sugar stored in our liver because glucose is blood sugar. And here you can see cellulose, a polysaccharide from the plants. Thank you. This is where we'll start next time.